please, Dr. Wilson. irreducibly entangled. So yes. I'm wondering what implications do your views have for transgender health? Well, we're working on that just right now. And I think the molecular biology of the so-called disorders in developmental uh, sex, uh, the concept of gender dysphoria, and ultimately of homosexual behavior, <clears throat> should start with a molecular, an examination of the molecular biology of these phenomenon and then, of course, how the environment amplifies or impacts them. So it's an extremely interesting question that you ask. Do you have, a, do you have an answer of your own? Usually, people who ask a question have a point of view. Um, I wasn't quite sure. It, well, on the one hand, it seemed that many people who uh, transgender, they, they want a, a more sort of social model of it. The, the attempt to sort of reduce it to a molecular mm -hmm. level looked like a, a kind of essentialism which many people who, who are sort of uh, identify as gender queer would feel that was exactly the thing that they were trying to, to fight against. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're just beginning to explore those kinds of, what shall I say, fluctuations in sexual development and inclination, and I think that we have to start with the molecular biology. Um, I wanted to comment that the brilliant last slide of uh, Dr. Diego Gracilla uh, Quillen's um, presentation was really the point that we must all, I think, consider here, which is how difficult it is to promise the individual an accurate and complete detail of how he or she should be diagnosed, treated, and disease prevented without knowing how to integrate the incredibly concept impact of the environment in which that person has existed and how, at a molecular level, epigenetically, that has impacted gene expression. And I think that that is the great problem that lies uh, at the heart of the conference, for me, anyway. Yes. Professor Gracia. Ah. Professor Um I'd like to, so I think doing this analysis by molecular biology would be challenging in a lot of ways, but what I would point out is the 6,000 people we have in Aravel with data clouds for up to four or five years range in age from 20 to 90, uh, so we can look all the way across development and the ratios is roughly 50-50 male to female, I think they afford really a unique opportunity to see differences in gene expression at all stages of exactly. life and so forth. So I think, I, I think being able to use these data clouds is gonna be incredibly informative mm -hmm. just to the uh, issues you're talking about. I, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I really appreciate your talk and also I think that the issues you're raising, we could have a whole seminar on it because um, I think partly what you're raising is the question of how we conceive of the human um, because you're raising big questions about how we break ourselves out into sex and gender and of course my area has been focused on race which um, you know, maybe we can talk about as well but the way in which genomics is, is fundamentally challenging um, ways that we've ordered ourselves, um, which is a little bit different from the focus of your talk, but I want to keep it there because, um, you know, one, one, you raised the question of this relationship between biology or between biology or gender and sex, but I'm also interested in how genomics is fundamentally transforming our notions of gender and sex, so not only how they interact, but also how we're very much transforming the very notion of gender and sex. And I just want to give you one practical example. When the personal genetics companies started to do their testing in 2007, one of the things that they used for quality control was sex. It was seen that if you were female, um, you should have two X's, and if you were male, you would have an X and a Y. One thing they, of course, discovered, and this goes back to Joseph Finn's talk, you know, like 
the kinds of uncertainty we're introducing into the system by looking at things we never looked at before is that there were many people who had a why who didn't think they had a why. So then the question became, there became an ethical question and an epistemological question, which is whether or not you report that information, and also what does that do to our very notion of sex? How dimorphic is it? Um, and of course, you know, the, the classic work here is Anne Faust of Sterling's work on the five, the five genders. So I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on, in a way, what would be a much more challenging outcome of genomics, which is if we started to very much, if we started to challenge the very notion of a dimorphic sex, which would have implications for how we think about homosexuality, transgender, how we think about morality. Can you hear me now? Let's try this one. Oh. This, is this one? Uh, I think that the world is more and more aware of the fact that there aren't just two, two buckets into which we drop people, even at a chromosomal level, and that there, to begin with, all different combinations of X, Y, X, X, Y, no Y. Um, and also the question of how those uh, genes are modulated, or how those chromosomes are modulated. Um, and I think there are transitional forms on a molecular biological basis between male and female that are very important to try to define, express, and work into the tapestry of how we define the importance of gender. So from 1990, when we thought that men and women were transposable, uh, and then thought that we were really making progress when we said there were two buckets, XY and XX. Now we see that there are transitional forms at a molecular level, which are tremendously important. And so we are redefining our whole concept of what makes sex uh, in the individual, which you already knew. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Goniolo. Thanks a lot, uh, Marianne. I'm here. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thanks a lot for what you said. Uh, 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 I could be more uh, prudent concerning uh, some uh, uh, contemporary uh, scientific uh, uh, discoveries. Uh, many times we, we are too much enthusiastic about uh, the science we have. For example, uh, concerning epigenomics or epigenetics, whatever you want to call it. And uh, uh, certainly uh, the, the influence of the environment, now we are uh, understanding the influence of the environment, the gene mm -hmm. expression, but uh, within certain limits, for example, if you have a, a mutation for the hunting di Huntington disease, you will have the Huntington disease <laughs> whenever place you live. Or uh, I can train uh, as much as I can, but my body uh, could be as the body of LeBron James. That is, uh, uh, it should be, uh, uh, rather uh, uh, prudent uh, uh, concerning the science we have, and uh, uh, we should be uh, uh, rather prudent in using the science we have in order to, uh, uh, to analyze uh, uh, s a certain social situation, uh, like uh, uh, the possibility uh, uh, to have a, a different kind of interpretation of uh, sex and gender. Uh, it is surely uh, the interpretation of sex and gender that we have is strictly tied to the, to the science we have. But the science is changing, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we shouldn't be so enthusiastic mm -hmm. about the science we have because uh, I know. I think the lovely last slide that you showed, um, Diego, was so important when it said that we were making a promise of personalized medicine, but given the complexity of what makes up the individual person from what you said to what you're talking about is almost an empty promise and an almost unattainable goal. And you discussed the complexity of environment and society on the person. And there's literally, probably through epigenetics, a modification of genomic expression as a result of those factors, how you quantify them. Perhaps Dr. Hood knows better. Uh, than I how to approach it with his very intricate system of analysis and uh, phenotypic, genotypic, genotypic correlation. Dr. Hood, what do you think? 
Are you, are you getting at the environment's impact on the person? We are in a partial sense. I mean, y there are many ways you can measure the environment. They all cost a lot of money, so you have to temper your ambitions with your uh, financial reality. But, but I do think the clouds that we're using now to a first approximation begin to give you a sense of how one integrates genetic data with lifestyle data, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with environmental data. And I think that kind of information in the context of the sexes is going to be absolutely fascinating kinds of information. And again, across our, our uh, life stages from uh, youth to, to old age, I, th I think we'll learn an enormous amount. Mm -hmm. Now, making the observations and the statistical correlations is really only the beginning because statistics are not uh, mechanistic insights. And, mm -hmm. and you have to move from those statistics to hypotheses that you can test and, and uh, test by perturbation. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a sense, one of the fascinating points we have with these 6,000 people is there are 6,000 N of 1 experiments where we know precisely how they've been perturbed with regard to nutrition, inflammation, pre a whole series of different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And you can put that on the context of uh, two uh, sexual types. Mm -hmm. And of course, we can begin with that kind of a population to look at the range of different sexes because we do have the information to do that as well. So I think that's going to be absolutely fascinating. And once again, you can ask, according to your chromosomal constitutions, how, how, how does that collision between uh, self-genetics, lifestyle, environment, how does it change? And how does it change between exactly. sexes? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't know that we can answer questions, but we can certainly we can certainly begin to deconvolute the complexity in many ways. Thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that enormously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one phrase that we have not yet introduced was stratified medicine. And because many people do find the idea of completely personalized medicine untenable, <laughs> I think I'm among them, uh, I think there are two tensions going on in what you've said, and more generally, in this meeting. One is that if we are to look at stratified medicine rather than fully personalized, that is, patients broken down into groups, uh, stratified on the basis of genotypically, but also phenotypically, uh, that we need to introduce another variable, which is biological sex, and that stratification must include that. And that seems to me to be quite a tenable uh, argument, and your research contributes a new and very important factor to it. But in another sense, it seems to me that there is a tension in favor of regarding everything as more individualized in what you do, so, and more generally, so that rather than simply saying, yes, we must stratify on the basis of uh, disease-related genes, we must also stratify on the basis of biological sex. We are making everything more individualized. And I think, I really think that that would be a productive way of our discussing, not least because uh, here I think I'm going to be the, the bassoon rather than the cello in the orchestra, because <laughs> I'm a lawyer and philosopher. And the law does typically need to know in bifurcated fashion. So, for example, uh, with the case of persistent vegetative state, we had a very influential case, I'm sure you know of it, the Bland case in, in England in 1993, which was then uh, decided the wrong way, many lawyers felt, on the basis of allowing disconnection of the feeding tubes. And then four years later, we had a major paper in the BMJ coming out from the Royal Hospital on disability, uh, no, neural disability, isn't it? <coughs> um, and that was saying that actually it was more complicated than the law had thought at the time. And those who thought that the wrong legal judgment was made because it was more complicated were right. 
So I suppose what I'm trying to get at is that we're being pulled in two different directions in this conference. One is in terms of more individualization, and the other is in terms of accepting stratification is the best that we can do, but we need to include the right variables in the stratification, and biological sex is one of them, and gender. More complex than we had thought. <laughs>